All right, we're in business. Wanted to talk, I, the last couple of times I spoke, I talked about uh, different parables, and I wanted to continue talking about parables. This one's a bit different. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. Now, this is a parable, as you know, it occurs only in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. And Klein Snodgrass, I've mentioned his book before. He has, a, in my judgment, a terrific book on parables, uh, the name of which now escapes me, but uh, that's part of the joy of getting older. <laughs> Stories with intent, but it's a, it's a great book. And he says in that book about this particular parable, he says it's one of the three most difficult parables that Jesus told. So whether you agree with that or not, when you hear somebody like Snodgrass, who's devoted this much time studying the parables, and he classifies it that way, that's kind of a warning to tread with extra humility when you're jumping on something like this. Now, I think the, the context of the parable in Matthew, you know, it's in Matthew 20, 1 to 16. I think its setting in the Gospel of Matthew is really the key to understanding it. I'm almost afraid to hit one of these buttons, but I'm going to try. Now, in Matthew... So the, the parable is Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16. But in Matthew chapter 19, 16 to 22, that's the account of Jesus' conversation with the rich young man. And Jesus tells the rich young man in verse 21 of chapter 19, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Now the man, as you know, he went away sorrowful. And Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 19, verses 23 to 26, that it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's then, that's, that's then followed by this exchange between Jesus and Peter in Matthew 19, 27 to 30. Remember the parable's coming up, 21 to 16. We're right at the end of 19 now. He says, Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now Peter wants to know what heavenly treasure the twelve will receive in light of their renunciation of all things. You had the rich young man, you know, about talking about treasure in heaven, and he wants to know, well, what are we going to receive? We've renounced everything. You know, what kind of thing are we going to have? And Jesus tells them that in the new world, they will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he adds that everyone who's renounced worldly things to follow him will receive blessings in excess of what they surrendered along with eternal life. And then he says in verse 30, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Now the object to which that little proverb in verse 30 applies, the object to which it refers, that's crucial because the parable of the workers in the vineyard that we're going to be looking at is an elaboration on that statement. So we get right down here at the end of 30, and it ends with this, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. And then the parable is going to be an elaboration on that, so it's important to try to figure out uh, who is that referring to, the object to which that proverb refers. Now you can see that the parable is an elaboration on that, is apparent, because you look at 1930, right at the end before the parable starts, but many who are first will be last, the last first, the very next verse, it begins with for, right after that statement, for the kingdom of heaven is like, he launches into the parable, and then the parable concludes with, so the last will be first and the first last, which is a restatement of 1930, just in different words. 
So the parable is an elaboration on that. So we got to get a bead on uh, who's the object there, that proverb, uh, the object that, to which that proverb refers in 1930 is important. And I think the proverb refers, it's focused primarily on the honors or privileges that Christians will receive in the eternal state above and beyond eternal life. Honors and privileges like sitting at the Lord's left or right. Honors and privileges that Christians will receive in the eternal state above and beyond eternal life. I think it relates to Christians because Jesus is addressing his disciples. You see that in chapter 19, verse 23. But more importantly, Peter's question in 27 to 30, that's this dialogue between Jesus and Peter. And Peter's question is about the honors or privileges, the treasure in heaven from 1921 that are in store for the twelve. In light of the fact that they'd left everything and followed Jesus. And Jesus' response in, in 1928 and 29 refers explicitly to those who had followed him and everyone who has renounced relationships and things for his name's sake. So I believe he's referring to Christians. Verse 30 is connected with a contrasting you know, where it says, but many who are first. So it's, it's referring to the same group. So I'm convinced he's referring to Christians. And I think it relates primarily to the honors or privileges in the eternal state rather than in this world. Because Jesus told the rich man in 1921 that with the surrender of his possessions, he would have treasure in heaven. And then Peter said, well, what are we going to have? We've given up everything. Presumably, he's talking about the same thing. What will we have in heaven? Peter asked that. See, so suggesting when he says in heaven, that's suggesting that something other than reward in this earthly life is the focus here. Now, as I say, in reply to that, Peter asked, what are we then going to have? Meaning, I take it, what are we going to have in heaven? What, what rewards, what things will we have in heaven? And on top of that, Jesus refers specifically, as you see in verse 28, to what will be theirs where? In the new world. You see, he speaks there. You can Sometimes it's translated in the regeneration, sometimes in the renewal of all things. But that phrase or that clause is widely recognized as a reference to the consummated kingdom the eschaton, the end state, the final state that will exist when Jesus comes back. And just to show you I'm not making that up, let me show you a couple of uh, well-known scholars and what they say about the phrase. D.A. Carson says here the word palingenesia has to do with the consummation of the kingdom. Craig Blomberg, here the concept of regeneration or new birth reflects a completely Jewish background. Nothing less than new heavens and new earth await Christ's followers after he returns in glory. Donald Hagner, Palingenesia, which literally means rebirth or regeneration, refers here to the, end, to the eschatological renewal of the world at the end of the present age. So I think he's speaking about Christians. I think he's speaking about the rewards that they have in the eternal state, okay, above eternal life. Now, Mark chapter 10, verse 30, and Luke 18, 30, they make clear that disciples will receive a hundredfold blessing in the present age. They specify that. And they make that clear. But Matthew's omission. Of those words. His omission of those words. Favors the notion. That the emphasis that's picked up in the parable. Is on their honor or privilege in the new world. Because he leaves that out. It's certainly true. That you'll receive a hundredfold in the present age. But I don't think that's what Matthew is signaling. That what he's talking about is honors and privileges in the new world. And the enunciated principle, would to, it would apply to God's rewards generally, both now and in the consummation. But as I say, Matthew appears to be signaling that the parable is focused on the latter. Now, Jesus seems to be saying in verse 30 there, the way I'm looking, I think what he's saying is, is, is yes, Peter, there are honors and privileges in the eschaton. I used that word one time, and Daryl said, did I make that up? <laughs> I said, no, that just means the end time. Man. He was busting on me about that pretty bad. But 
But you see, the, the, he said, look, he says, yeah. He says, yes, Peter, there are honors and privileges in that final eternal state. There's treasure in heaven for those who renounce worldly things in following me. But, but, you see, those honors or privileges often will not be allocated in accordance with human assessments of entitlement. They often will not be allocated in accordance with human assessments of entitlement. On the contrary, reversals of expectations will be common. Now, I'm not going to explore with you the, the statement there in 28b, the second part. You, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel because it's not really key to interpreting the parable. But I will say that I think the idea is that at the consummation, when Jesus returns, at that eternal state, that when Jesus sits on his judgment throne, the twelve, as representatives of true Israel, the Israel of faith, they will in some capacity judge the unbelieving physical descendants of Israel for their lack of faith in God's Messiah. I think that's what he's talking about there. Now, you thought we'd never get to the parable, but all of that is, you'll see, because it, it, it informs how I understand the parable. He says in 21 to, 1 to 16, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. You know this parable well, so I'll read it quickly. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only, an, only one hour. These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first. And the first last. So there you see that phrase coming back. You know, the hiring of laborers, that was something that would have been commonplace in Jesus' day. But the repeated hirings throughout the day, that's simply part of the setup for the parable. I mean, you know how parables work, right? I mean, they don't have to track reality in every way. This is part of the setup. In real life, the owner would have been better able to calculate his needs so they wouldn't have to go out. You know, he goes out once, twice, three times. Uh, but that's this part of the setup of the parable. Now, a denarius, that was a day's, a day's wage for a day laborer. It's a very modest amount. Uh, most estimates put the poverty limit at that time around 200 denarii per year. And that, you know, that would hardly keep a family, a small family afloat. So we might think of it as like maybe minimum wage, but probably even less than that when you think about standards of living. Now, many people who read this parable, many people are convinced the parable of, is about the remarkable grace that God gives to undeserving sinners. But it's an elaboration on, or an illustration of the proverb in 1930. See, which as I explained, seems to relate to what is in store for Christians. Now if so, then the parable shouldn't be read as addressing the principle by which God saves sinners. 
but as addressing the principle by which God allocates rewards among Christians, even if the two are the same. You see, even if those two principles are the same, his point in the parable is how God is going to allocate these rewards in the eschaton, in the eternal state. And he's trying to caution the disciples. They have a misunderstanding. And he's trying to warn them about that. Now a key... Ah, I, I, okay, I think that changed. A key to the parable is that those who were hired first, those who were hired first saw that those hired last received a denarius, the amount for which those hired first had agreed to work. You see, those hired first came when they, they see that. And when they saw that, they'd agreed, denarius, uh, that's fine. Yes, I, I'm happy to do that. I'll work all day for a denarius. When they saw the latecomers get a denarius, then they thought they would receive more. They now had an expectation that they would receive more. So when that, when that happened to them, they expected to receive more because they'd done more work. They would have been perfectly content to receive a denarius, but for the fact the people who did less work received one. And they were angry because the master did not elevate them above or distinguish them from the other workers based on their extra work. That's why they're angry. You didn't elevate us above or distinguish us from the other workers based on the fact we did more work and they charged the master with wrongdoing in treating all of them equally. And I think the point is that disciples will be blessed in the gl in, with glorious eternal life at the end time in the eschaton, but the giving of special honors or privileges in that state, such as sitting at the Lord's right or left, the giving of those special honors or privileges often will not comport with human notions of entitlement. Human notions of entitlement are the first being first and the last being last. Right? And so he's telling them that the giving of those things often will not comport or fit with human notions of entitlement. All labor will be rewarded. But God is free, meaning He's not unjust, to give as He chooses the same or more to one who did not labor as long or under as difficult conditions. See, He blesses based on His generosity, not on human notions of entitlement. And because He does that, the door is wide open for surprises for reversals of expectations. So it's when these guys saw that, they had an expectation that was frustrated. And he's telling them, that will happen because the giving of these things is not based on notions, human notions of entitlement. It is based on my generosity. Therefore, you can expect these kinds of reversals. So, and he cannot rightly be criticized for that. Let me read you what R.T. France, he's a well-known New Testament scholar in his commentary on Matthew. He says, those whose renunciation has put them at the forefront of the Jesus movement might naturally expect to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, as their question at 18.1 has shown. But there is no such guarantee. Those who have borne the greatest weight of loyal service for the kingdom of heaven cannot assume that their reward will be greater than that of others. In the kingdom of heaven, nobody earns their status even by spectacular renunciation. They may rightly expect a reward, but not necessarily the reward of preeminence. The kingdom of heaven, which operates by divine grace rather than by human achievement, is a great leveler. Now, I think Jesus tells this to the disciples. You say, what's going on? Why is he talking about this? Why does he bring this up? I think he tells this to the disciples because at least some of them, 
they were unduly focused or interested in their status in relation to other disciples. They seemed to really be interested in that. In Matthew 18.1, right before here, Matthew 18.1, they're interested in who's the greatest in the kingdom. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, James and John through their mother, they request what? They request to sit at Jesus' right and left in his kingdom, which are positions of relative honor. And Peter's statement and Peter's question in, in Matthew 19, 27, it likely carries the assumption that we are the most worthy of rewards. We've spectacularly renounced all things, so, okay, now let me hear it. We're in for a lot of stuff, right? So it, it seems that they had this focus on one another, and Jesus, in my judgment, he wants them to know that they're unable to secure preeminence in the eternal kingdom because their expectations of who should be elevated are not reliable indicators of who will be. You see, that makes it pretty tough then, doesn't it? If you don't have a map of who's going to get preeminence, who's going to be elevated, because your expectations and your reading are not reliable indicators. So you're going to have to ditch that. See, God in His generosity, He may justly honor someone who doesn't fit their expectations, doesn't fit their criteria of reward. First is first and last is last. He says He's going to go first, last, last, first. You say so it doesn't, doesn't fit with what you're doing. So it's pointless in terms of seeking preeminence to focus on the labor of other disciples as a standard or motivation for their own labor. Just labor for the Lord. Just labor for the Lord free of the desire to secure a larger crown than your brother and leave the rewards to the goodness of God. You see, in light of their interest in preeminence over one another, it's the same idea. Jesus warns them in Matthew 20, 25, right down after this. Jesus warns them there against seeking to rule over others. That's the opposite of greatness in the kingdom, which is measured by being a servant or a slave to the other apostles. So ruling over others in this world would be the last way to create an expectation of elevation in the eschaton. So let me just end with saying that as we serve God as, as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, let us do so because of who He is. Let us do so in gratitude for what He's done and not act out of a sense of trying to one-up our brothers or sisters in God's eyes. See, one-upping is based on our concept of entitlement and the fact is the last will be first, and the first last. So I think that's what he's driving at. But I, I tell you, you know, as I say, it's, uh, it's kind of involved. But I do believe that's it. If we can help any of you, that's all I have. Uh, we're going to sing a song, so you know how we do. If we can help pray with you, help you in any way, you let us know that when we sing this song.